sure I got that on there good. Okay, um, I'm going to be doing a devotion tonight about something that's very dear to my heart. Um, I've done devotions in the past on music, on God's feelings, on the King James Bible, and so obviously I like to pick things that are dear to my heart. Those are topics um, that I like, and um, I wasn't going to do a devotion like on Galatians 6, 7, you reap what you sow. That would kind of be hard. So obviously I pray about it and I pick something that I like. Um, so I'm going to be talking about friendship tonight. And I'm going to be showing you in the Bible what a true friend is, because a lot of the time in the world we can get screwed up of what a true best friend is and what it should be. But when we get back on track with the Bible, we realize, okay, that's a true friend. So, obviously, when we're talking about a true friend, I will relate it to uh, your earthly friendships and stuff like that. But most of all, I want to bring God glory. So, uh, Lord Jesus Christ will be your truest best friend. So, I'm going to go ahead and start in Proverbs 27. I'll kind of talk a little bit more, but... I have you turn to Proverbs 27. And a lot of the times when we hear, you know, a true friend or a best friend or something like that, we feel like we might be past that stage in our lives. That's for children or that's for, you know, your teenage years or something. And then once you grow up, that's just kind of something that, you know, oh, well, I can take it or leave it or... Uh, but I don't care how old you are in here, everybody yearns for a true friend. And a lot of the times I feel like the world will belittle that because you're used to people just coming and going throughout your life and you're not used to anybody really sticking with you or it's not, oh, that's just a fairy tale or, you know, there's not really anybody who matches any of this stuff in the Bible. So you just kind of brush it off. But I guarantee you, Hopefully, by the end of the night, you'll realize that you want a true friend. So, I'm going to show you what a biblical true friend is. And one of the things that the world will present as a true friend is you just support your friend in anything that makes them happy. Have you guys, you've probably been out in the world and know, if that makes you happy, then you're supposed to support that decision they make or... But that's not biblical, because a true friend is going to tell you the truth even when it hurts. So let's just say I had a friend who wanted to go out and be a Hollywood actress or something. Now, that might make them happy in the moment because they're making a lot of money or, you know, pursue your dream and all that stuff. The world will say, well, you should back your friend. That's their dream. But that's not a biblical friend, because the end of that is... You get into drugs, you get into alcohol, you leave God. So I want to show you in Proverbs 27, verse 6, what the Bible says a true friend is. This is one of the traits. It says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, in my flesh, that goes against me. In my flesh, you think if you care about somebody, the last thing you want to do is wound them, right? If I care about my friend or if I care about somebody, the last thing I want to do is hurt them because wounds hurt. But the Bible says that you're a faithful friend if you wound them. So I want to look at John 8.40. Turn to John 8.40. I'm going to show you here. A good example, Jesus Christ himself. John 8, 40. Jesus talking, it says, But now ye seek to what? Kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I've heard of God, this did not Abraham. So there's going to come a point in your life 
where you're going to have to make a decision of, do you want to stand up for what the Bible says and tell the truth, or do you want to compromise and just get along? Everybody's been in that position in their life where, you know, you have to tell your friend or somebody you're close to that, no, what you're doing is not right, or that's not a good decision, or this is why this is not right, according to the Bible. And I've been there before in my life where it's tempting to just go along because it's easier that way. It's like, I don't want to have this fight today. Um, it's going to cause confrontation. It's going to cause friction in my friendship. And I don't want to lose this person. And uh, I know that in times in my life that I've stood up for the Bible and stuff. In the moment, you're like, I don't think the Bible's right because this doesn't feel right. This person's mad at me now. They're not talking to me. They're giving me the silent treatment. But I promise you, I've used it. I've stuck to that verse that faithful are the wounds of a friend, and it works. So now anybody who knows me that's close to me knows where I stand. And so it's like, okay, if you, if you want to bring up that topic, then you know where I stand on it. So, and they know that I'm doing it because I care about them. I do it because I love the person. So the Lord is right on when he says, wound them. And doesn't he do that with you? He corrects you, right? Not because he hates you, because he loves you. So I'm going to turn to Proverbs 27 again, back to our text, and we'll read the last part of that verse. Some of you are probably still mulling over. I don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> I know, it's a hard one to swallow, but praise the Lord, you stick with it and it works. The times I haven't stuck with it and I regret it. Like, you know, I should have spoke up, I should have said something, I should have told him that was wrong. Shows that you don't care about the person as much as you thought when you don't say the truth because the truth will help them. So, Proverbs 27, 6 again. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, you think a kiss is usually a sign of affection, right? I know that even still in the Middle East and European countries, they greet each other with a kiss to show affection, and we don't do that in America, but <laughs> over in other countries they do that. So it's usually a sign of affection. But the Bible says that the enemy's kisses are deceitful. Somebody who's always agreeing with you all the time, somebody who just says, whatever makes you happy, I'll support. Um, stuff like that, who's always flattering you and giving you compliments all the time, which I'm not saying compliments are bad. You should compliment people. But you know what I'm talking about, where it's fake. They're actually the first ones to backstab you, the ones that are so nice, the ones, you know, that are just... Would, say they'll do anything for you and all this stuff, they're usually the ones who betray you. So go ahead and turn to Luke 22. I'm going to show you. I'm not lying, and the Bible's not lying. When it says that your enemy's kisses are deceitful, you can get deceived by people being nice to you and flattering you, and then the person who tells you the truth you don't like. Luke 22, verse 47. It says, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? So the Lord was betrayed by somebody who was in the twelve apostles, who was in that inner circle, with the Lord, walked with him, talked with him, saw all his miracles, and he betrays him. He didn't point and say, there he is, or he didn't give any other sign, but he kissed him, because a kiss can be deceitful. It's an enemy. And I think the Lord said that for a reason, that we watch out who we associate with, who we put ourselves close to, because somebody you think is your true friend they don't line up with the Bible, they'll be the ones to backstab you. Amen? 
Okay, so now we went over, they'll tell you the truth even when it hurts. Now we're going to go over, a true friend helps you when you're down. So turn to Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes 4. And I know there's been times in my life that I've been down. It could be physically, it could be spiritually. And if you're down physically, if your health goes or something goes wrong, you lose your job or something like that, a true friend is going to be there. You know, you'll tell the true friends from the fake friends. Fake friend will just leave when the bad times happen. And that can go for spiritually too. A lot of the times we go through a spiritual desert you know, we just get in a routine and we're not really reading our Bible like we should. We're not praying like we should. You need a true friend there to help encourage you in the Lord. Amen. So Ecclesiastes 4, and we're going to look at verse 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? So the Lord gives us in his word that a true friend is there to help you when you fall. It says that if you fall, the one will lift up his fellow. And he gives a warning of woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So a lot of the times, as Christians, we tend to isolate ourselves. And, you know, it's just going to be me, and I'm not going to get hurt, and I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm just going to block everybody out, which is good. I mean, you can follow the Lord. But the Lord didn't make us that way. The Lord created us to have, that's why he created the church, so we can have fellowship and everything. Um, so he says two are better than one because you'll help each other. If you have a true friend, especially like verse 11 says, it says, how can one be warm alone? Spiritually speaking, how can you stay warm for Christ without somebody encouraging you? It's kind of hard when you're alone all the time to stay encouraged to read your Bible, to stay encouraged to, you know, go street preaching, to stay encouraged to do this and that. It gets, you know, depressing. But if you have a true friend, they'll be like, hey, come on, what are you doing? I thought we were going to street preaching today. What do you do? And I thought we were reading our Bible today. Aren't we doing Bible study today? Or they'll just encourage you in your walk when you're feeling down about something. They're like, you got to snap out of it. God's good. You know? That's what a true friend does. And um, I remember one time uh, I picked up my friend Grace and we went to Pizza King or something. And I'd had, I don't know why I was miserable that week, but I just was like, depressed and just going through a bad week and I couldn't figure out why I was just irritable and I was just like I don't know what's wrong with me and I kept trying to figure out because everything was okay in my life and everything was going good and uh, she got in the car and I could tell she was in a mood and I was like oh this is gonna be fun but <laughs> she probably doesn't remember this but I remembered it because it helped me out uh so we went to Pizza King and ate, and it was, you know, it was all right. We're just like, okay, we've had a long day. We'll just eat and go home. And then, so I dropped her off that night. Before she got out of the car, she's like, you know, I'm sorry I'm being like this. And I was like, okay. She said, but I know what's wrong with me. I said, well, tell me. And she's like, I haven't been praying to God like I should. And she's like, and I'm miserable. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's my problem. And just by her saying that, admitting that she was having a miserable week because she hadn't been praying like she should, you know, we tend to get prideful, like, oh, that's not me. It's got to be something else. <laughs> but, you know, she just let her guard down. She's like, you know, I'm miserable because I'm not praying like I should. And that's why I'm not having a good day, and that's why I'm not having a good week. And, like, you just pinpointed it. I reflected on my week, and, like, I just threw up prayers just miscellaneously, half-heartedly, 
wasn't reading my Bible like I should, and then I wondered why I was miserable. So you need somebody like that in your life to come along and be like, hey, this is why we're miserable. We're not praying to God like we should. So that's what a true friend does. They uplift you when you're in that spiritual wasteland. You're in that funk. You're in that routine of just day in, go to work, day out, do this, go to the grocery store, do that. It's like, no, take time to pray with the Lord. And after that, I felt a lot better. I feel like a big weight was lifted off my shoulders. Something so simple. I'm like, why did I not think of that? But at sometimes you have to have a friend there. There it is. The Lord uses people. <laughs> so praise the Lord for that. But I'm going to show you. True friend helps you up. So let's look at Psalm 40. Psalm chapter 40, look at verse 1. I hope you're starting to see that you really want this in your life because a true friend is something very special and it's a gift from God. And the truest friend you can have is found in Psalm chapter 40. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And here it is. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. So Ecclesiastes said, true friend helps you when you're down. The Lord reached down into that horrible pit and the miry clay, it's all muddy down there. You can't get yourself out of that. You can't. I've tried. You think, I know the answer. I know the answer. I just got to do this, this, and this, and one, two, and three, and then you slide right back down, and then you go deeper, and then you go deeper. You're like, man, I'm never going to get out of here. And you get miserable because you still have sin that you're trying to battle. You have maybe a particular sin that you just keep fighting. And you're like, okay, I'm never going to get the victory on this. Well, have you asked the Lord to bring you out? He's a true friend. He said he would. A horrible pit. Yeah, I've been there in my life. You get down and you're like, man, I'm getting defeated, Lord. And he reaches down and gets you. That's a true friend. If you don't want that in your life, then something's wrong. Because we've all been there in our lives. When we get down and we feel like, man. But the Lord's the only one who can reach down. He's a great God. Amen. I'm going to go over what else a true friend does. And the Lord's been hitting all these, hasn't he? He tells you the truth, even when it hurts. The Bible says that the, the Bible is sweet when you first taste it, but then when you swallow it, it's bitter. And you think, why is that? Why is the Bible bitter? Because it's the truth. You want the truth. But then when you have to apply it to your life, it hurts. But the Lord does that for your own benefit. He tells you the truth when it hurts. We've seen that he helps you when you're down. And now we're going to see that a true friend will delight in you. So turn to 1 Samuel 19.2. 1 Samuel 19.2. A true friend will delight in you. Verse 2 says, But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. I'm just going to focus on that part. 
if you don't know, Jonathan and David were very good friends in the Bible. It's kind of a type of what a true friend should be. And it says that Jonathan delighted much in David. Now I'm going to tell you what delight means. Because we've heard the word before. But sometimes we don't know exactly what it means. Delight is a high degree of pleasure or satisfaction of mind, joy. So when you delight in someone, that's what a true friend does. They bring you satisfaction. They bring you joy. They bring you a high degree of pleasure. And I'm not going to say that's 100% of the time. You're going to fight. If you're really close, you're going to fight. But that person should bring you pleasure. And... I know that when I was working at Kunkel's, uh, I had a manager that would ask me to eat with him and split stuff with him because you got it cheaper that way. So we would split stuff. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that was a good day. That was, I had some good food and all that stuff. But then it's like when I'm working with my best pal, Grace, and she'd be like, okay, let's split some food. You're back there combing the menu and like, oh, do you want to get triple cheeseburger today? Or do you want to do cheese cubes? Or is because you delight in that person. Anything that you do together, it's like, hey, this just changed everything. My manager, okay, I don't really care. But (laughs) when it's like your true friend, you're like, hey, this is going to be fun. And I know you don't believe that we ate triple cheeseburgers, but we did, (laughs) just for the fun of it. And then we get cheese cubes and all that stuff. But when you delight in somebody, just the smallest of things, you want to do things for them, you want to be with them, and you want to help them. That's delighting in somebody. And I'm going to show you how the Lord delights in us. And it's found in Psalm 18, 19. Psalm 18, 19. And I know that you think sometimes, I do, I think, how could somebody like God delight in me? How could I bring him any pleasure? Well, he says it right here. He's talking about David. So it's possible for a human being to bring him pleasure that he gets joy out of you. Psalm 18, verse 19 says, He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me. Why? Because he delighted in me. He took pleasure in getting David out of his situation. He delivered him because he delighted in him. He took joy in it. He took pleasure. He had high satisfaction in delivering David. And I pray that the Lord looks at me like that, but I know that he does because he's delivered me out of a lot of things in my life. (laughs) And that verse is very comforting to me to know that I can be pleasing to the Lord, that he wants to be around me, that he wants me to talk to him. And he wants to deliver me. He wants to help me. But I have to be willing. I have to do my part. So we've seen that a true friend will tell you the truth when it hurts. They'll help you when you're down. They'll delight in you. And I've shown you human friendships. And then I show you how God does it. So God is always, he hits all the marks. Not everybody will hit all the marks. You're going to have people let you down. And that shouldn't discourage you. They're human beings. But God hits all the marks. So if you really want a true friend, which I do, it's very important to me to have a true friend, the Lord will be there. He'll hit all, all these marks. Everything that you've ever yearned for in a friend, he'll hit them all. So we're going to go to next, First Samuel 18. And we're going to cover a couple topics there. First Samuel 18. We're talking about Jonathan and David again. It says, First Samuel 18:1. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. 
And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Now we see a few examples of what a true friend is in these verses. Verse 1, it says that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Now that's pretty powerful. And in the world, they'll say that's impossible. That's impossible to be that close to somebody that your soul is knit together. And I looked up, it's in Judges 2011, if you want to put it in your margin, um, a, defi a biblical definition of what knit is. When you're knit together, it means you've become one. So if your souls are knit together, you love that person as yourself, as your own soul. And we love ourselves and our souls pretty well, don't we? Amen. So you should love your true friend enough to uh, help them, to feed them. And I'm about to get it into the other verses, so I won't spoil it. But you should love them just like you love yourself. And that seems foreign to us today. We're like, oh, I'll get it another day. Or, oh, somebody else will help them. Or... I hope that if something happened to where I was on the side of the road or something, that I would have a true friend that would come pick me up, or I know I could call them and then come get me or say, where are you at? Or they could help me get somebody to get me. Or, you know, if I was in a pickle and I didn't have food or if I didn't have water. I know this sounds extreme because we're Americans, but it might come to that one day. I don't know what the Lord has in store, but um, especially with food, we take care of ourselves with food. So we should take care of our true friend, but also spiritually we should take care of them. If you're getting fed with the Bible, you should be feeding them with the Bible. Vice versa. If you know Grace is getting fed with the Bible, she should be feeding me with that. Vice versa. So a true friend will love you as their own soul. And look at verse uh, 4. When you love somebody as your own soul, this is what you'll do. It says, and Jonathan, what? Stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and he gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Basically everything that he had. He saw that David needed it. He took it off himself. He just didn't go buy it. He took it off himself and gave it. So that's what we like to call sacrificially giving. Because... I know you guys have heard the slang, that person would give me the shirt off their back. Well, that's biblical. If you truly love your friend and you see a need that they have, you'll take what you have on you and give it to them sacrificially. And that's what Jonathan did with David. And I want us to turn to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, and we're going to be looking at verse 27. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ stripping himself. Matthew 27, 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him, and put, him, put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him, and let him a way to crucify him. And skip up to verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, 
casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and my vesture did they cast lots. So I wanted to show you that the Lord Jesus Christ was stripped of everything. And why was he stripped of everything? Did he have to do that? No. He gave it. He saw a need, and he stripped himself because he was the only one who could get you to heaven. We're all sinners. So there was a need. He saw it. If he didn't come down here and live a perfect life and die and strip himself of everything, he was on the throne in heaven. And he humbled himself as a man and came down here and gave it all up for you. That's a true friend. And that's the truest friend you will get because there's people who will go far. There's people who would even give their lives for you. That's as much as they can do. But they can never buy your soul. They can't buy it. So the Lord Jesus Christ saw that need and he came down here, gave it all up for your soul. That's a true friend. So praise the Lord that he saved our souls, that he gave up heaven to come down here. And I don't see, just by me living day by day and all the sin that I do, just in my thought life, just in stuff that I do that I don't do that I should do and that I do that I shouldn't do, I don't see how the Lord did it. So that makes me admire him because he came down here and had to live a sinless life in this flesh. He, wasn't, he was God Almighty, 100%, but he was robed in this sinful flesh. And he had to conquer it, and he had to go day by day just like us with all the temptations. Yet he did it without sin. Amen. So praise his precious name. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I'm going to close tonight. I've got a few more verses for you guys, and then I'll let you go. Um, turn to Second Samuel. I haven't lived very long. I'm only 27, but time and time again, I've seen that the Lord Jesus Christ is your true friend. Second Samuel 1, and we're going to look at verse 26. This is back to Jonathan and David again. We're concluding their friendship and how it went. Um, just to give you a little context, uh, Jonathan was killed in battle, and David received the word. And this is what he says about Jonathan. Verse 26. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Now, once again, the world will say, that's not possible. You can't have a closeness or an intimacy with somebody like that without it being perverted. They perverted. It's not perverted. This was a true friendship, a godly friendship. And they truly loved each other like that. And a lot of the scholars will look at that verse and say, well, they had to be homosexuals to do that. So they use this verse to prove that Jonathan and David were homosexuals. And I hope you know, if you've read enough Bible, that that's not true. David was a man after God's own heart. Amen. He wouldn't be a homosexual. This was a clean and it was a pure love for another man, a man loving another man. That's a friendship. And he said that it passed the love of women. So that shows you how much love that he had for Jonathan. And I'm going to show you in John 13 how friendship is a clean relationship and you can be close without it being a physical thing. So John chapter 13. We're going to look at John here. John was called the beloved disciple. 
He was uh, the Lord's loved disciple. He was close to John, and John was close to the Lord. So look at John 13 and verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now this is a man and a man. And John is leaning his ear, his head on Jesus' chest. That's where your heart is at. That's a friendship. He called his disciples his friends. So it can be, you can have a close relationship with someone and it'd be clean and it'd be a soul thing and a heart thing. You can be attached to someone like that. And that's how John was with Jesus. And I hope and pray we all strive for that, to lean on Jesus' bosom and hear his heart and what he wants us to do in this life to please him and have that intimacy with him and have that relationship with him, a friendship. And sometimes we complicate things of it has to be this big old thing before I talk to the Lord about anything. No, he just wants a relationship. Talk about your day, say what was wrong, what irritated you, or that you need to get better, or please help me to do this, Lord, or I'm going to have a rough day tomorrow at work, or little things. That's what friends are. It's not just a Every three months when something happens, you call up a person. Would you consider that a true friend? I wouldn't. Like every three months, I'd be like, hey, something happened to me and I need your help. No, I consider a true friend somebody I keep in constant contact with. And just tell them like, hey, do you know what happened to me at work today? Can you believe this? That's why I consider a true friend. So I hope tonight has been an eye-opener that you want that with the Lord, first and foremost. And I hope that you pray that if you don't have a true friend, that the Lord would send you one to encourage you. You can serve the Lord together, because it's a beautiful relationship that the Lord's created, is friendship. So I'll let somebody close in prayer, or...